Uh, hello, I'm Nelson Liu and thanks for joining us for Western Perspective. This week, WA is facing a threat to its safety from COVID-19, with Clive Palmer launching a challenge in the court to force the McGowan government to relax its hard border. Premier Mark McGowan wants to keep WA's border closed to protect the state from the pandemic, but Mr Palmer says it would hurt both the WA and national economies. So will it affect the state and the rest of the country's ability to recover? I talked to political expert Dr Ian Cook about what it could mean for WA. Could Mark McGowan be forced to relax his hard border on COVID-19? I mean, I think there's a very good chance that the, high, the federal court in the first instance and then the high court will force Mark McGowan to open up WA's border. Why, why though? Well, I mean, the question is about constitutional power and whether the states have the ability to sort of, to some extent, isolate themselves off from the from the federation which is not something we would expect from states and questions of constitutional power are now you know what we're talking about and it will come down to it and it's un, you know there's nothing in the constitution that i can see that gives the state government the capacity to shut its borders i mean in a, a situation where there's a big health crisis at the moment well the constitution doesn't have that sort of nuance it doesn't have a sort of provision for if the circumstances get that a certain way then you've got a capacity so the constitution i, I don't think it has that sort of you know, nuance, that sort of subtlety that allows emergency situations to change anything. Constitutionally, what could be the issue here? Well, I mean, it's a, ba it's a basic sort of question of power. You know, is it within the, the power of the state government to close its borders? And it has to find that power under the Constitution. And, and the Constitution gives the states technically plenty of power. It's just not clear that it gives it this power. What kind of problems could arise constitutionally, though? Well, I mean, I think to some extent what happens, you know, if WA is sort of told to open its borders and chooses not to cooperate, um, you know, we might have questions of, you know, who's, which police forces are actually fully active in these sorts of moments. I mean, it, you know, it'll move out of the Constitution. It'll be a question of, OK, you know, who's going to back off and who's actually going to you know, allow people in? You know, is Mark McGowan going to allow airports to open in such a way that they are going to accept travellers? And so, you know, there's a little bit of stuff on the ground that'll be sorted out here. It will get out of the courts. You know, they'll give us, they'll give us a, a decision and then it'll be a question of well, how the government's going to behave. Will Mark McGowan just turn around and say, OK, we lost, you know, it's opened up? Or will he go, oh, look, we might have lost, but we can sort of control this a little bit and prevent full opening. And I think that's where the next level of negotiations are going to come. Now, Clive Palmer is behind this challenge to Mark McGowan. Um, where do you think Clive Palmer is heading with this? Well, I mean, to some extent, you know, it's partly just about Clive Palmer and getting himself back into the spotlight. You know, because Clive Palmer has been out of the spotlight for quite a long time and this is a, an opportunity for him. I mean, it's also part of a general move, the sort of, you know, economic openness, returning to, you know, economic production. And, and I guess Palmer's trying to sort of see that in, you know, as a sort of mining industry, wanting to open this state up again. You know, so I see to some extent he's going to talk free markets and an economic benefit. But, but mostly this is about Palmer's reputation. So this is also partly about, it's a business decision as well. Oh, definitely. And he's made an investment to some extent to sort of, you know, to push the Palmer brand, to, to, to push the envelope politically. It also, you know, it's also about, you know, economic interests and, and the major players in the parties, you know, particularly the Liberal Party. Other than the health concerns, what kind of problems could WA face? Well, I mean, for the most part, we do have these difficulties around controlling movement. Yeah, to, it might be difficult for them to force us to accept people from Victoria, perhaps New South Wales, because we are seeing outbreaks there. If we open up to South Australia, which is, what, I guess, what, what they're talking about in the first instance, you know, there, there are questions about who gets into South Australia and then gets into Western Australia. So, you know, there's, there's conversations beyond this, because I don't think it'll be just a case of Mark McGowan saying, OK, everybody can come in. He's going to want to say, no, no, no Victorians, no New South Welsh people, and generally want to sort of, you know, manipulate the conversation from here. You know, so I don't think it'll be just a, you know, open doors. If Mark McGowan is forced to relax the borders, um, how do you see him handling the problems that could arise afterwards? Well, I mean, I think the big thing will be he'll make it the federal government's problem. You know, we, the, the shutdown in WA for Mark McGowan has been incredibly successful in terms of his popularity. And his main problem is opening up and us having another COVID outbreak. And so, you know, if he can just play this as a federal government move, that he didn't want this, he didn't support it, any outbreak is a, a federal government responsibility and not a Mark McGowan responsibility. I mean, that will be a crucial part of his political strategy here because that will mean he'll be able to keep his reputation about dealing with COVID but not be damaged by any outbreaks in WA. 
you think that we could see another Victoria happen here in WA? I think it's less likely that we're going to get a situation like Victoria. We don't have the sort of density that, they, that they've got you know, in Melbourne, in some parts of Melbourne. So I think that you know, in general, WA should be able to manage better than, than you know, Victoria and Melbourne. And finally, in your view, what is the likely outcome of this challenge? I mean, I think that the, the WA government will lose. I think they won't be able to force be forced to open up completely. They'll have some control, so there'll be negotiation between the federal government and the state government about just how open WA becomes. So I think the conversations are, are very much about cooperation at the state and federal government levels. And now, the AMA WA's President, Dr Andrew Miller, provides his weekly COVID-19 update. Hi, thanks for your time. Uh, it seems incongruous to me that I'm in Dunsborough enjoying uh, Western Australia's success uh, whilst my colleagues uh, and people that uh, I care very much about in Victoria are going into stage four lockdown this evening. And uh, while there are hundreds of people in hospital there, dozens in ICU, what can we do uh, to prevent this from happening around the country and remain in a situation where we can help other states rather than be facing the same problem? Well, firstly, we can stop helping the virus travel around. Uh, and one thing that's important about that is to keep uh, the border in Western Australia tightly controlled. Um, Clive Palmer needs to uh, wise up and withdraw this court case. Uh, the federal government has got smart about this and gotten out of it. I'm not convinced that it's um, anything other than they think they'll be very unpopular because of it, but they need to um, accept responsibility for having brought in evidence and experts into the court, and uh, that's very unfortunate indeed in a situation where we now understand what we should have known all along, which is this virus is incredibly wickedly hard to control and controlling the border is a very important part of knowing when it is coming into our state. So very unfortunate that court case has happened at all, but it needs to stop now. What else can we learn from Victoria? Well, partial lockdowns, half measures to try and reduce the spread once you have community spread are very ineffective. Uh, you need to go to community masks very early and you need to go to lockdowns very early uh, if you see any sort of significant community spread. Their Achilles heel has been the aged care sector. We need to know in WA, how is the extra money that's been injected into aged care being spent? We need to know, are there inspectors going in and making sure that our facilities are very different to those in Victoria in the care that they're providing, uh, in the monitoring that they're doing, and in relatives' ability to be able to speak to their loved ones in there? Because the aged care domino uh, is the one that has fallen in Victoria and is now starting to bring other parts of the system down with it. So the hospitals are starting to get overwhelmed. Uh, as a result of their staff becoming infected through this process. And now there are hospitals that have upwards of uh, 100 people who are infected per hospital. Uh, so then you get all the extra people who are quarantined as a result. Uh, you get a thousand people quarantined, then all of a sudden a lot of your workforce is looking shaky in terms of filling the rest of your rosters. So the ICUs there, the problem's not the ventilators, the problem's having the staff uh, to be able to look after the patients who are on those ventilators. This is why we can't let it get a foot in the door because once it does, uh, it, it becomes impossible to control. Um, the PPE provided to healthcare workers on the front line uh, is the last line of risk control that they have. Now, certainly there are more important risk controls, but those aren't in place. So they don't have great air conditioning in many places. They don't have good separation. They don't have good cleaning of the phones and the computers and the desks and so on. All those things are very important, but you can't do bargain basement PPE as is being advised by the federal government at the moment, uh, by their experts. You cannot do that in messy situations. So we need to move to a more Singapore style uh, PPE regime here, uh, which uh, sure, those masks are a couple of dollars more, um, but don't tell me that I don't need it when I'm resuscitating uh, somebody who ha could possibly have coronavirus. Uh, so let's just get over that and give the people on the front line what they need. I think there's reason to be optimistic that eventually we will bend and start to flatten the curve in Victoria, but I do believe that there are unnecessary infections uh, and bad illness and deaths and long-term disability being caused uh, by not being careful enough about this virus. We need to be very, very humble. Uh, I would like to uh, also congratulate Dr Omar Khorshid from Western Australia, who's just been elected this weekend to the presidency of the federal uh, AMA. Look forward to working uh, with him in my capacity as the state president and we'll do everything we can 
uh, to try and keep this virus out until there is a vaccine, until there is a cure uh, for it. Uh, because the alternative for the healthcare of everyone and the alternative for the economy is just terrible. And we're seeing that in Victoria. Our heart goes out to them tonight. Uh, stay safe, everybody, and thank you for your time. And that's all for this week. We'll be back with another episode of WP next time. But until then, it's back to you, Ivan and Sarah. Thank you, Nelson. And that's our weekly news and current affairs. For news anytime, you can visit our website and social media pages. See you next weekend and have a good evening. Wish you good health and take care. Thank you.